Are you ready, Mr. Browning? Ready on the firing line. Commence firing. I'm Fess Parker. Some of you might remember me from a few years ago when I played the role of Davy Crockett. In those days, old Betsy was just as important to an immigrant as food and water. It was this period in history which influenced the creative talents of perhaps America's greatest gun inventor, John Moses Browning. Over a 45-year period, he would change the course of modern firearms development. For centuries, man has used firearms in combat, self-defense, and in competition. The first type of portable firearm was a hand cannon or powder shaft appearing in Europe in the mid-14th century. Then came the match lock, followed by the wheel lock in the 16th century. Because of the cost, often the owners of such firearms were the wealthy. With such ownership came competition for fancier and more costly pieces. Firearms also became works of art. The Snappens and Michelet lock systems preceded the introduction of flint ignition in the 17th century. Developed in France, the flintlock was distinguished by its combined flashpan cover and frizzen and by its half-cocked mechanism. By 1660, the flintlock had spread throughout Western Europe and was exported to colonial America in large quantities. Until 1830, most sporting and military firearms in the Western world were flintlocks. Then, from Scotland came the percussion cap, which eliminated the need for a flintlock mechanism. With a breech-loading system and the percussion cap in the early 19th century, a new era dawned on firearms evolution, the revolving cylinder. By 1836, Samuel Colt and the Industrial Revolution were responsible for the first American firearm to be mass-produced. These events greatly influenced another gun inventor, Jonathan Browning, the father of John Moses Browning. It was in this setting that a jack-of-all-trades by the name of Jonathan Browning became fascinated by firearms as a young boy in Tennessee. America was on the move. Horace Greeley's Go West Young Man and Manifest Destiny became many an immigrant's clarion call. Jonathan made this revolving rifle, and even earlier, this rather ingenious slide gun, or harmonica rifle. Invented in the 1830s, this is one of the earliest American repeating rifles. This gun was made by Jonathan Browning, and after more than 140 years, it still shoots pretty good. The magazine of this gun is simply a rectangular bar chambered for powder and ball, with cut-in nipples integral with the metal, one at the rear end of each chamber. The length of the magazine and its consequent capacity is limited by convenience. Jonathan considered five shots about right. After Jonathan established himself as a gun maker on the Tennessee frontier, he moved to Quincy, Illinois. He was then converted to Mormonism and moved to Nauvoo. In this growing religious community, he constructed this house, which has been restored, and he then continued his gun trade. Not only did he make most of these tools, but he also made his own gun barrels. 
This little instrument is called a swedge, and this is what he used to form a piece of flat iron around a mandrel to form a barrel. Once it was forged, it was placed on this rifling machine, which he also made. It was said that a man would walk 14 miles in order to rifle and complete one barrel. After just four years in Nauvoo, my father, Jonathan Browning, and the other Mormons were forced by mobs to flee for their lives. With thousands of others, he left his home and property, and together with his family, crossed the frozen Mississippi over to Iowa, where he set up shop again near Keensville on the Missouri River. Father played a key role in outfitting the Mormons as they began their trek to the Great Basin. He also helped equip the 500-man Mormon battalion, called on to help fight the Mexican-American War. Finally, in 1852, with seven wagons, $600 cash, his wife and 11 of his 12 children, he joined 10,000 other Mormons for the trek to the Salt Lake Valley. That year, 70,000 pioneers participated in Manifest Destiny and the westward expansion. 10,000 to Utah, 10,000 to Oregon, and 50,000 to the gold fields of California. Ogden had long been a popular site for fur trappers. Kit Carson, Jim Bridger, Miles Goodyear of the Hudson Bay Company and others wintered here and traded with the Indians. As the Mormon pioneers arrived, the last of the fur trappers departed. Ogden was also a part of the Overland Trail. Later in the year when the weather was good, the California-bound immigrants took the Overland Trail through Ogden and then on to the gold fields of California. After three months of living out of a wagon, it was here, 35 miles north of Salt Lake City, that Jonathan Browning and his family settled. It was now a bustling frontier settlement of some 1,500 people. Jonathan immediately set up shop to service the travelers. With $600, he was a man of substance. Being a devout Mormon and following the counsel of the church then, my father married a second wife, my mother, who bore him two sons and a daughter. I was born in 1855, my brother Matthew in 59. Our sister died in infancy. Father married a third wife who bore him seven more children for a total of 22 children. Father, happy is what we called him, was successful as a jack of all trades, including leather tanning, metal repair, stitching, brick making, and gunsmithing, but he never invented any more guns. At age 10, John made his first gun. With an old discarded barrel and a stock whack from an old two by four, John and his eight-year-old brother Matt knew where some prairie chickens were dusting themselves in the hills above their home. Now. Did you get him? Either the rust in the barrel or an over-generous powder charge they netted three birds in one shot. John and Matt would later become lifelong business partners. Things were happening which helped to affect John Browning's future. The railroad was coming to Ogden. The Browning boys must have watched with some anticipation as the road crews worked the nearby Echo and Weber Canyons on their way to the famous Union at Promontory Summit in 1869. Ogden became the junction city for the Union Pacific and the Central Pacific Railroads. Within a few years, thousands of passengers would pass through Ogden in a single day. The railroad coming to Ogden would prove to be a key ingredient in John M. Browning's success. In 1878, shortly after my 23rd birthday, I had the parts to a single shot spread out on the table. 
I commented to no one in particular that I could make a better gun than that myself. Pappy, who was sitting next to the workbench, looked up and said, I know you could, John Mose, and I wish you'd get at it. I'd like to live to see you do it. I filed for a patent about a year later. That same year, I married Rachel Child, and two months later, my father, Jonathan Browning, passed away at age 74. But not before he had made just one more gun. My first patented single shot. Now that he had a rifle of his own design, John decided to build a gun factory. With $1,000 from savings, he and his brothers constructed a factory, a shop, and manufactured 25 rifles. When all the single shots were completed, they placed them on the rack in their new shop and sold them all within a week. Together with accessories, most sales totaled over $30 each. With his first gun manufacturing success under his belt, John rewarded his factory workers, his four brothers, Sam, George, Matt, and Ed, and an English immigrant by the name of Frank Rushton, all a $5 gold piece. With $800 in the bank and no debts, John set to more inventing and manufacturing. Sometime in 1883, a salesman for Winchester came across Browning's single shot. Within a week, T.G. Bennett, vice president of Winchester, was on his way to Ogden, Utah, to buy the gun. This rifle, which would become the Winchester Model 1885, would fill the dangerous gap in his line. Among the many pieces in the Cody Firearms Museum collections are models and examples of every product produced by the Winchester Repeating Arms Company from its inception through 1981. As a result, we have patent prototypes and experimental arms produced by all the company's designers. We also have a number of sectionalized Winchester products, including this Model 1885 rifle, which demonstrates the internal workings of John M. Browning's patent. As you can see, it's a very simple design, which when closed is locked in position by a vertical member. The simplicity of this design meant that the rifle could be chambered from all cartridges from 0.22 to 0.70, including the largest express cartridges then marketed in the United States. As a result, the Winchester Company had a virtual monopoly on single-shot rifles. In 1887, I left for two years to serve as a Mormon missionary in Georgia and Tennessee. A couple of months into the mission and after many days of walking dusty roads, my companion and I entered a small town in Georgia and I noticed a gun shop. On entering, I quickly discovered the Model 87 lever action shotgun, which I had invented for Winchester just a few months earlier. And despite our appearances, I felt compelled to have a look. Say, Fred, you handle that pretty well. Well, he ought to, he invented it. The shop owner was not convinced. Upon his return to Ogden in 1889, he set to work to make up for lost time. He turned out 20 new patents over the next three years. Once John got started, there was no stopping him. From age 29 to 44, a 15-year period, he turned out 52 different firearms. Counting time out for two years as a missionary, that averaged one every three months. I believe one reason John Browning's designs worked so well is that he had the gift and the craftsmanship to take his design from his mind to his shop and create it in three dimension. He could work with tools and develop his ideas without the necessity of relying on others. Today we have some sophisticated computers that uh, can illustrate a part from many angles and even integrate it uh, with other parts right on the screen. But 90 years ago, John Browning's mind and his hands were accomplishing that same thing that we have to rely on computers for today. The man himself was a genius. There's no doubt about it. 
He could work up designs in a remarkable period of time. He also had the luxury and the benefit of working with probably the best firearm designer in the world. He worked with the people at Winchester who perfected his initial designs. Remington, Fabrique Nationale, Colt. He was fortunate in that because it allowed his products to be come to fruition much quicker than they might normally have had if he had just been working by himself in Ogden. Winchester's T.G. Bennett in about 1890 asked John to come up with a new gun like the Model 86. He admitted that the Model 73 was falling off in sales probably because of some of the new improved models coming on the market. He wanted to replace it with the quality of the 86. And so he offered John $10,000 if he could come up with one in three months. If it could be done in two months, he would make it $15,000. John calculated quickly and told Bennett he would have it in his hands within 30 days for $20,000 or give it to him. Well, John must have been pretty confident because that rifle was being fired within two weeks. Well within 30 days, it was in Bennett's hands. The Model 92 became a great favorite. Andy Oakley loved it, and Admiral Perry carried it with him on his dash to the North Pole. Another hit for Winchester was the Model 1894 3030, a popular saddle gun and hunting companion. It's been said that more deer have fallen to a 3030 than any other hunting rifle. The Winchester 3030 has sold well over five million and is still in production today. The model 1895 Winchester was for big game. Teddy Roosevelt used it and he referred to it as big medicine. Because Winchester is stamped on every gun, he and probably millions of other Winchester owners were never aware of the gun's inventor. John Browning often said, the best gun is the simplest gun. Once worked out mechanically, the lever action principle appears simple enough. Lowering the lever pulls back the breech block, cocks the hammer and expels the cartridge case from the previous round. Pulling the lever back up sends the breech block forward again, lifting a new cartridge from the magazine into the chamber. John also said, it's not so hard figuring out the essentials of a gun mechanism. The trouble is getting the essentials in the right place. I'm sitting at the workbench where John and Ed and his other brothers worked on the invention of new firearms. The creative spark is often nothing more than the faintest glimpse of an idea. And many of John's ideas were born just that way. In the spring of 1889, at the weekly shooting match of the Ogden Rifle Club, John and his brothers were waiting for Will Wright, who was firing at the target. Sack the rifles, boys. I got me an idea. As they returned to the shop, John then explained to his brothers that he figured the same force which caused the grass to shake from the muzzle blast could be harnessed to make the gun work automatically. John grabbed a rifle, which was handy, wired it to an inch board, then drilled a hole in a piece of wood for the bullet to pass through. Hand me that block of wood. Now, if my theory is correct, the muzzle blast should send that block of wood hell winding. He figured that the block of wood close to the end of the barrel would demonstrate his theory. The muzzle blast did send that block of wood across the shop. Within a day, he had a lever arm and pan attached activating the lever action of the rifle which caused it to fire automatically. The original prototype without the lever 
shows the crude hammer marks where he affixed a flapper and pan to the end of a 73 Winchester. By 1890, John had filed a patent for the gas-operated automatic machine gun. That same year, he wrote out a letter in longhand to the coal factory asking if they were interested in that kind of gun. Early in 1891, he and Matt arrived at the coal factory for a demonstration. Onlookers were surprised to see this crude-looking prototype firing automatically with simply the push of a button. Hidden smiles were soon erased as John's hammer-beaten model fired 200 rounds without a hitch. It was at this meeting that the Browning saw the Gatlin gun for the first time. The men at Colt were further astonished that John had never seen a machine gun before coming to Hartford. Later that year, it was fired unofficially for naval ordnance and fired 1,800 rounds without a stoppage. After one more official test in 1893, the Colt Model 1895 machine gun was put into production. It became the first automatic machine gun ever purchased by the U.S. government. It was used in 1895 in the Boer War in Africa. Just two of these guns were used by the Marines in 1900 during the Boxer Uprising in Peking. They were also used in the Philippines and in the Spanish-American War during the first decade of the 20th century. It was in the Spanish-American War that the Colt was nicknamed the Peacemaker. Browning soon learned that the recoil, produced by the rearward pressure of the powder gases, could be utilized to make guns operate automatically. In 1901, he secured a patent on a recoil-operated, water-cooled machine gun. It was put on the back burner for the time being. When he wasn't turning out rifles for Winchester and machine guns for Colt, Browning began adapting the gas and recoil principles to the invention of an automatic pistol. In the same year that Winchester announced the Model 1895 and that Colt began production on the Model 1895 potato digger, Browning announced the development of a 38 caliber automatic pistol. Between 1894 and 1896, John invented six large frame semi-automatic pistols, one of which became the Colt Model 1900. That same year, Browning presented a 32 caliber version to Fabrique Nationale in Herstal, Belgium. Fabrique Nationale, or FN, began mass production in 1899 and thus introduced the first Browning semi-automatic pistol on the world market. Within 10 years, they produced over 500,000 Brownings, or the Model 1900 pocket pistol. This introduction to John Browning started FN on the road to becoming the largest small arms supplier in the world. John's first love was sporting firearms. While turning out six different pistols and a machine gun for Colt, he knew the same principle would apply for an automatic shotgun. John and his brother Matt were two of the four Bs, a nationally ranked shooting team, Browning, Browning, Becker, and Bigelow. At his weekly shoots with the Ogden Rifle Club, he invited other members to test his new automatic shotgun. Thousands of rounds were fired as he perfected the mechanism. It took a year, more time than any other firearm he had ever invented, to overcome the challenge of different powder loads. The solution was simple. A set of friction assembly rings, split and tapered, which could be switched to increase or decrease friction on the magazine tube to suit the kind of ammunition. This simple but effective device outlived the use of black powder and serves the same purpose today, making possible the use of light and heavy loads in the same gun. In 1899, John presented the idea to Winchester's Bennett. After two years of deliberating, Bennett decided not to take the gun. He was not willing to pay a royalty to Browning nor was he willing to risk Winchester's successful line of pump and lever action rifles and shotguns. After 44 guns in a 19-year relationship, Winchester and Browning parted for the last time as business partners. Not being put off, John went to Remington to meet with its president, Marcellus Hartley. While waiting outside Hartley's office, John was informed that Mr. Hartley had just succumbed to a fatal heart attack. John decided it was now time to make his second trip to Belgium. 
John and his Auto 5 shotgun were greeted enthusiastically at the Fabrique Nationale headquarters in Herstal, a suburb of Liège. Within 60 days, John signed exclusive world sales and manufacturing rights to FN. John Moses Browning came to Liège around the turn of the century because Liège was at that time one of the major, if not the major, gun-making center of the world. And there was a habit for American inventors or other inventors in Europe to come to Liège to have their patents manufactured here. And so did he at the time. Uh, it's quite an old tradition. Benjamin Franklin already came to Liège to buy weapons for the American so-called insurgents during the War of Independence. But later in the 19th century, uh, great American inventors like uh, Colt, Borchardt, uh, Colonel Lewis, uh, Browning, of course, came to Liège to have some of their weapons produced by the local gun makers. He was at first looked at by the local population as a rather strange figure coming from a very far away country at the turn of the century. And later on he became very familiar and in fact he was even caricatured and photographed in local newspapers because he was really a uh, conversant with the population and very commonly seen in the streets and in the public places in Liège. And also, he was a very plain, very simple man. But he had so much input in, in the realm of gun making that everyone respected him as the absolute reference in gun making at the time. In America, even as late as 1900, hunting for some was almost as much an occupation as a sport. The American hunter was a pragmatist whose primary objective in the field was to put meat on the table. It was not difficult to convince him of the advantages of a fowling piece capable of firing five fast shots without reloading and that could be depended upon to function without failure under the most adverse conditions. But in Europe, the hunt was still an upper-class sport, indulged in only by the privileged few and conducted decorously with rigid rules of conduct, costume, and weaponry. FN salesmen found a ready market in the rest of the world. Because of its reliability and design, it became a favored gift to kings and royalty, and ultimately came full circle to be accepted in Europe. Well over three million Auto 5s have been manufactured and are still in production today. Following Browning's successful sale in the U.S. of the first few thousand Auto 5s, the U.S. raised foreign tariffs. As a result, John and Matt returned to Remington in 1905 and signed contracts for U.S. sales and manufacture by Remington. Browning's Auto 5 would come to be known as the Remington Model 11. So what made John Browning tick? He was once described as the most gun-shy genius the world has ever seen. John was content to invent, see the fruit of his labor, and then move on to inventing another firearm. A part of John's success on the world market was due to his brother Matt's business acumen. John did the inventing, and Matt most often did the talking. They were lifelong partners, and especially in the early years with Winchester, Matt and John were inseparable. At the same time FN was producing Auto 5s and Browning was getting Remington ready for production of the Model 11, he produced yet more pistols. He produced a 9mm blowback military model for FN, the Model 1903. This was adopted by the Swedish Army as their official sidearm. Another 25 caliber version for FN called the Vest Pocket, which by the way set in motion the production of over 125 different copies made in many European countries, and a strengthened version of the 38 caliber automatic for Colt. Colt requested a larger version to meet Army requests, and Browning came up with the 45 caliber. During the four years that the Army studied the pistol, 
Browning busied himself between Colt, Remington, and FN. Finally, the competitive trials were set for March 3rd, 1911. Six thousand rounds were to be fired through each pistol under consideration in series of one hundreds, cool for five minutes, then fired again. got too hot, it was simply dropped into a bucket of water. The trials ran through two days of fire. Seven rounds to a clip, clip after clip. Finally, the booming came to a halt. That's it. We did it. Three cheers for Mr. Browning. Congratulations. The pistol became the first automatic arm to make a perfect score in government trials. Some 2.7 million have accompanied troops through two world wars, Korea, Vietnam, and in numerous other actions. As you know, the Model 1911 .45 caliber Colt Browning pistol was in service for 74 years before a replacement was uh, attempted or, or selected. This is relatively incredible that a single gun has been in service for that length of time. And I think it speaks to the genius of John Browning's uh, small arms design capabilities. Not long after the government trials, Browning was honored at a gala event in Herstal's FN offices. A banquet was thrown in his honor on January 31st, 1914. The millionth pistol had been finished two years earlier, but this was the first time FN could get John to light long enough to honor him. On this date, 1.3 million pistols had been produced. With pistol and shotgun production, FN's prosperity was unequaled in gun manufacturing. Browning was a hero. Europe. Uh, the generic term for a self-loading pistol is a Browning. Uh, when people say, uh, I'm going to go out and buy uh, a pistol as opposed to a revolver, they oftentimes say, I'm going to go purchase a Browning. And in fact, in Russian, uh, there is no term for self-loading pistol. They just have the term Browning. In 1914, the government requested a 22 caliber practice model of the 1911 45 caliber version. John made it for them, but it was never put into production. Colt produced it, however, and it became the Woodsman, one of the most popular target pistols ever manufactured. When the U.S. declared war on Germany on April 6, 1917, it was ill-prepared to effectively do anything about it. With 1,100 machine guns in its arsenals, compared to the thousands of Maxims the Germans were using, quick action was required. Colt was commissioned to begin immediate production of Browning's 1895 potato digger. The government also announced competitive trials to determine viable weapon alternatives. John was ready. He brought with him two firearms, the 30 caliber water-cooled machine gun, which he had patented 16 years earlier, and the machine rifle, dubbed the Browning Automatic Rifle, or the BAR. The BAR made an immediate impression. Emptying its clip of 20 shells in two and a half seconds, it was also simply constructed the 70 parts could be disassembled and reassembled in 55 seconds. The BAR became the second Browning gun adopted by the U.S. government. As soon as the guns came off the line, they were shipped to France, where John's son, 
Lieutenant Val Browning demonstrated the BAR to the troops of the 79th Division near Verdun. On May 17th, an official endurance test was scheduled for the 30 caliber machine gun at the Springfield Armory. A total of 20,000 rounds were fired without a malfunction or broken part at a rate of 600 rounds per minute. Browning decided to test it further and fired an additional 20,000 rounds again without a malfunction. Some were still skeptical because its performance was so astonishing. A second machine gun was then tested. It was fired continuously for 48 minutes and 12 seconds. John further demonstrated the simplicity of the machine gun by taking it apart and putting it back together blindfolded. This would become a standard test which soldiers from three wars will recall. Browning's third government gun went into immediate production to aid the war effort. Before the armistice was signed, 43,000 machine guns have been manufactured. The government contract John agreed to was for full production of the Colt 45, the BAR, and the machine gun. In addition, he and his brother Ed were to oversee production of all three weapons, which ultimately involved work in six factories. Colt with two factories, Westinghouse, Marlin Rockwell, Winchester, and Remington. While the factories were close together, John and Ed's family saw little of them for the next two years. Had John demanded standard royalties, the government would have owed him $13 million. They offered him $750,000 for a package deal, and he accepted, saying, Major, if that suits Uncle Sam, it's all right with me. His brother Matt asked John later why he settled without the slightest argument. John's reply was, yes, and if we were 15 or 20 years younger, we'd be over there in the mud. Before the war had ended, General John J. Pershing demanded a weapon of larger caliber. With only slight modification, John had one test firing for him within months. With a unique oil buffer, increased velocity and caliber were achieved without a marked increase in weight to the gun. John was then asked to make a rapid-fire cannon with 37mm projectiles. At age 66, he was tired and was more interested in sporting arms. But John couldn't resist the challenge. Within two months, he had the gun firing at the hills east of Ogden. At the government test, once again it performed with 100% precision. During the last decade of his life, John returned to Ogden where he still had some inventing to do. He made one more pistol, the 9mm high power which fired the Parabellum cartridge. It was made for FN and ultimately adopted by the Belgian Army. The high power became one of the most widely used pistols in the world. Presently, it is the official sidearm of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization countries, with Browning's model utilized by seven of those countries. His last shotgun and his final firearm invention was the superposed. This over and under shotgun is still in production today and ranks among the best of its kind. In 1926, John finally persuaded his Rachel to travel to Belgium with him. It was her first and his 61st trip. The day after Thanksgiving, he and his son Val went to the plant as usual. We got to my office and took off our coats and I went to my desk and he went out to make his tours of the shop and pretty soon came back. Said he wasn't feeling well. I called the factory doctor and he came up immediately. My father said, son, I wouldn't be surprised if I'm dying. Now the doctor felt his pulse again and said, well, he isn't doing well. And, and uh, he gave him another shot in the, a deep shot in the leg. Something, I don't know what it was. And it, after he got that shot, and within two minutes, he was dead.
John Moses Browning's work did not end with his passing. In 1935, the U.S. once again began rearming itself. With Browning's foresight and Pershing's demands, U.S. arsenals were soon manufacturing his 30 and 50 caliber machine guns, known as the M2. In varying nomenclatures, there were seven variations, all having interchangeable receiver parts. Army and Navy anti-aircraft, water-cooled, ground and turret type heavy barrel, and fixed, flexible and turret aircraft guns. More than 60 different models have been adapted to land, sea, and air use. It's noteworthy that through World War I, World War II, and the Korean War, all the automatic machine guns used by the United States troops in the field or mounted on U.S. planes, tanks, and naval vessels were Brownings. Because of his contribution to the U.S. war effort, Rock Island Arsenal Museum, the second oldest in the United States, in 1959 renamed the museum the John M. Browning Memorial Museum. The Battle of Britain began with over 1,500 German aircraft a day bearing down on British harbors and ports. Britain's fighter command had been reduced to just 600 planes. Every remaining Spitfire and Hurricane, however, was mounted with eight Browning machine guns. Among the official German papers seized at the end of World War II was a message from Field Marshal Goring to General Rump. If the German Air Force had had the Browning 50 caliber, the Battle of Britain would have turned out differently. One of the ways to build the confidence of, an, of a soldier in his weapons is to show him that they really work. On a number of occasions, the museum has taken part in weapons demonstrations for cadets. And one in which the results are always the same is to compare World War I heavy machine guns. We use a Browning Model 1917, a German Maxim, a French Hotchkiss, and a Vickers machine gun. And each demonstrator has silhouette targets, balloons, and a cinder block wall. The Browning operator demolishes everything in minutes without any stoppages. And the other operators have usually something of a struggle to fire all their rounds. The cadets conclude the same thing that many people in this century have concluded, that Browning designed weapons really work.
Even today, the Browning machine guns are part of the U.S. military armaments and are also in use in many other countries. The Browning 50 caliber, patented in 1927, and whose original idea came from the 1901 patent of the 30 caliber, is still in use today. John Browning's first love was sporting firearms. I'm sure he would be pleased to know that many sports shooters today are still using his designed firearms. Today, most Browning firearms are manufactured in Kochi, Japan. Production of a Browning design firearm is not much different today except for a few high-tech machines. While very few people own firearms in Japan, the workmanship at the Miroku factory meets the quality standards that John Browning would have required 75 years earlier. State-of-the-art robotics and computer assistance ensure the integrity of each firearm. Some steps of gun production will always require the human touch. Even a century ago, gun production enjoyed some rather ingenious mechanization. At Miroku, similar methods are used, but with greater efficiency. The stock of a gun requires a quality hardwood. This particular walnut comes from California. Again, High-tech mechanization will never replace some steps of gun making. On the other side of the factory, Browning shotgun stocks are checkered, efficiently by machine and carefully by hand. They are sanded, buffed and varnished before wood and metal become joined. Each gun is test fired for pattern display. Paper targets are no longer used. Computers now tell the story. The Miroku factory produces thousands of sporting firearms annually. Most are Brownings. Meanwhile in Liège, where John Browning came nearly a century ago, a small shop still makes the Browning high grade. These shotguns represent just 3,000 which will be manufactured this year. Just as in 1902, when John's first shotguns were produced here, detailed handwork ensures the quality he would have required.
Pan checkering of the stock is a standard feature of a browning high grade. The finishing touch is the artwork of the engraver. For centuries, Liège has been known for its world-class engravers. A hundred years ago, there were over 200 engravers in Liège. There are less than 20 today. Browning firearms account for more than 90% of their work. The back and forth tapping dovetails the groove from the chisel for gold inlay. Once the dovetail grooves are completed, the gold thread can be tapped into place. Requiring hours to complete a simple design, the finished quality is timeless. More often, the engravings are complex, requiring days to complete. The more common engravings are hunting scenes, often evoking memories of a favorite hollow or mountain where a boy and his father spent precious moments together. Some are more elaborate. Gold inlay, the history of an empire, a tribute to a great man, commissioned royal gifts to heads of state. Anywhere from a full day to 175 days are required in the engraving of one firearm. Special commission pieces will sell for tens of thousands of dollars. Again, appropriate to the longevity and quality of Browning's designs. Except for working at a bench on another firearm, John's favorite place to be was in these foothills, walking distance from his shop and home. Not counting the hundreds of copied versions of his sport pistols, shotguns, rifles, and military weapons, it is reported that well over 30 million firearms have been manufactured from his designs. And he was, as T.G. Bennett described him in 1903, a true genius. John Browning was the right man at the right time. So in many ways, uh, you can probably take all of the other 20th century small arms designers, lump them together, and you, if you could create one person out of them, you would have someone who just about matches John Browning. And that particular touch of genius, which was typical, so typical of John Moses Browning, was recognized by the local armorers. And the workman at FN called him le maître, that is, the master, because obviously he was towering, a towering man not only in stature, but also by the genius of his mind. There have been other good inventors, but none as prolific or revolutionary. The relative ease with which he moved from inventing one type of firearm to another was astonishing. From pistols to shotguns, lever actions to pumps, automatic pistols to machine guns, John Browning had no peer. 128 patents, and over 100 separate firearms place him in a class by himself. When asked what he attributed his success to, he replied, the time and the place for a gunmaker just got together on this corner, and I happened along. 
Of course it was luck to drop me here. And it didn't just walk off and leave me. It's stuck around pretty close ever since. <laughs>